Good morning, everyone. My name is Will Pomeranz, and I'm the director of the Kennan Institute. And I want to thank you all for joining us today to discuss the current refugee and migration crisis resulting from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. A few housekeeping measures to go over before we uh, begin. Uh, I encourage everyone to stay up to date on the latest Kennan Institute events and publications by visiting our website and our, uh, and our various blogs, Focus Ukraine, The Russia File, and our new Russian language blog, In Other Words. You can also subscribe to our podcast, Kennan X and The Russia File. And I encourage everyone to visit our um, Hindsight Upfront collection on our website as well for the latest news, news and analysis on Ukraine. If you'd like to ask questions uh, to our speakers today, uh, you can submit it via email to Kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page at any time. Please include your name and affiliation when sending questions. Uh, I will just give brief introductions to our distinguished panel, uh, but I encourage everyone to refer to our web event webpage to read their full bios. Um, we have uh, a, a very distinguished panel. Uh, I'll just list all the people who are supposed to be joining us. Some of them are a little bit late, but uh, we will uh, deal with them as, as they arrive. But first is Dr. Cynthia Buckley, a professor of sociology at the, uh, at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Next, joining us uh, hopefully soon will be Dr. Frank Duval, a researcher at Osterbrook University at the Institute for Migration Research and Intercultural Studies. Next, we have Andre Korobkov, uh, Professor of Political Science and International Relations at, the, at uh, Middle Tennessee State University. We will also be joined by Vladimir Mukamil, who is the Chief Researcher of the Head of the Center for the study of interethnic relations um, uh, in, in Russia. Uh, he's also a part of the uh, next, next we have Dr. Alexei Pozniak, who is head of migration studies and a member of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Uh, we will also be joined by Mikhail Sava, who is chairman of the board of SOVA Expert Group. Uh, and also a member of the Expert Council for the Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine, uh, our, the most recent Nobel Prize winner. And finally, we'll be joined today by uh, Yana Kastachi, the State Secretary of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Moldova. So it is a very large and distinguished panel. Our goal is to have both a conversation and a discussion Obviously, these are very emotional issues, uh, but we are we feel that the Kennan Institute is the proper place that we can discuss these issues and have a greater understanding of the situation of uh, and, the, and the cost of migration throughout the post-Soviet space. So we're going to begin by just asking a few questions, and we will then have our uh, participants answer. But we also encourage our participants to answer questions uh, after and, and raise questions during our discussion as well. So I'm going to begin with our first issue that we've distributed. And it is the question is the refugee flow from Ukraine in historical perspective. How does it compare to other similar flows in the post Cold War era? So anyone who wants to jump in on that question, uh, we'll start the conversation. I'd probably uh, start if, if it's okay. That's okay. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to say that the current crisis, uh, it uh, indicates uh, the uh, two phases of migration studies in general. Uh, very frequently, even uh, experts on migration, they discuss the issue based on macroeconomic uh, indicators, uh, usefulness or uh, some negative consequences of migration for states. 
uh, this crisis puts a human face on migration and refugee flows, and it's very important not to lose it. Uh, the human side of uh, uh, this issue, the scale of human suffering. Uh, well, the current uh, refugee crisis uh, uh, is the largest uh, of the post-Cold War period, and essentially it's the largest in the last 50 years. The scale of uh, uh, the flow, uh, well, at least the initial one, if we don't take into account the return migration, exceeds that of Syrian civil war, of uh, uh, the Soviet-Afghan war. In both cases, the uh, scale of refugee flow uh, was in excess of 6 million, but, uh, well, U uh, Ukrainian figures, at least uh, at its peak, at least ac according to Ella Libanova uh, from Kiev, uh, was about 8.4 million. So it would be very interesting to hear from our uh, participants from Kiev what are their estimates of this scale and what is the scale of return migration. Of course, a special uh, impact on the situation uh, is uh, exercising the fact that involved in this conflict is uh, a nuclear power uh, that uh, started the invasion. And uh, this severely complicates the situation in general. Uh, some of the figures that uh, were spelled out recently indicate a tremendous scale of return migration. And uh, I would really love to hear from uh, our colleagues in Kiev whether they uh, uh, agree with these figures, with those estimates. One of the figures was that more than 7 million uh, have returned already. We also have to take into account a tremendous number of internally displaced uh, persons who are uh, much less visible for the international community. And, uh, uh, well, Will, if you don't mind, I would uh, probably uh, like uh, to ask Alexei Pazniak uh, what is his view on these figures. You, uh, Will, you, your mic is off. Oh, yes. Uh, I, uh, yes, we'll turn I to can, Alexa. Uh, I can say uh, that um, uh, great, great figures uh, based on uh, uh, border guard uh, data. Um, uh, but uh, uh, in fact, uh, um, uh, the, the flow of uh, uh, forced migrants uh, from Ukraine uh, uh, took place uh, uh, in uh, uh, end of February, uh, March, you know, probably uh, beginning of April. Uh, since that time, uh, the, the majority of uh, entries uh, and uh, exits, from, uh, exits from Ukraine and, that, and entries to Ukraine uh, uh, are uh, different forms of uh, shuttle, uh, shuttle migration. Uh, this is a uh, temporary return uh, of external uh, labor migration uh, for celebration on Eastern, East, Easter uh, two, two, two times, uh, Catholic and uh, Orthodox East, uh, Easter. Uh, the second uh, is uh, arrivals of uh, uh, women and uh, children to meet uh, their husbands' uh, pa 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 parents. Uh, uh, this uh, explains uh, the significantly higher number uh, of entries to Ukraine on uh, Saturdays uh, in the period from the end of March to uh, mid-July. Uh, uh, the third uh, reason is um, uh, the third flow is a process of shuttle migration for the purpose uh, of uh, withdrawing uh, cash uh, abroad from the cards of uh, the Ukrainian banks, which is quite uh, profitable given the exchange rate uh, difference uh, when uh, withdrawing cash in Ukraine and abroad uh, and uh, uh, further resale of foreign currency in the black market. Uh, also, there is uh, so-called uh, uh, automobile uh, shuttle migration. 
uh, related to the import of, of used uh, cars for own use or for sale uh, without paying uh, access uh, duty uh, from uh, in, in period from uh, April 5 to the end of uh, June. And also a small uh, cross border uh, cross border traffic uh, border crossing by the resident of the territory located at a distance uh, within up to uh, 30 uh, kilometers uh, from the common border with uh, Moldova, Poland, uh, Romania, Slovakia and Hungary for various social cultural, uh, family, and uh, economic reasons. In uh, particular, um, for buying uh, products. And uh, uh, the last form of uh, shuttle migration is a movement of uh, uh, of uh, volunteers. Um, with periodical trip uh, brought and back. So this is explain uh, so great uh, number of uh, exits uh, from Ukraine and entries from Ukraine. Ukraine. Uh, the first, first, first uh, um, uh, migration is uh, smaller. Uh, no, we have uh, about uh, four uh, 0.2 million uh, people who have uh, status uh, in uh, European countries. Hey, Alexa, I, uh, Cindy Buckley wants to jump in here, and I think she wants to give a little bit more of a comparative uh, perspective and historical perspective about the refugees and theory. Uh, so let's uh, turn it over to Cindy, and then uh, are, are, you, are you ready to, to jump in there, Cindy? Or Sure. Sorry, your 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 mic your, your mic is problem problems with uh, listening in English. Yeah. Uh, you conti continue uh, speaking, uh, Cindy. And we'll see how the um, how the audio is. Okay. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. Um, as most of us, I'm tuned in myself to listen to our esteemed colleagues from Kiev. I just um, while we're getting this incredibly insightful analysis, um, I think it's important to remember that while the size of the, the displacement, both internal and external, is enormous, um, as uh, Andre pointed out, there's a couple of things to remember that first, it is historically unique because of its rapidity. When we think about the millions that are displaced in a very short period of time, this far surpasses a lot of previous studies of displacement, whether it's refugee flows or IDP flows, historically. And those are the cases that we tended to build theory on, where we tended to come up with ideas about refugees who are gone more than three years are very unlikely to return to their place of origin. And other sorts of approaches we're really relying on descriptive cases that are significantly different from the Ukrainian um, context. And in Ukraine, it is a massive displacement of a country that has a developed transportation system, that has very high levels of access to private automobiles, trains, buses. This makes mobility and the flow of the displaced both out and back in much more accessible to a much larger population, that Ukraine had many labor migrants in Eastern Europe prior to the escalation of Russia's hostilities in February of 2022, which also provide, provided networks and ties for people considering leaving the country that just weren't existing in a lot of historical cases of displacement. I think all of those contexts and Ukraine's geography opens it up to a really different type of displacement and a much larger flow that is extraordinarily complex, as um, Professor Pozniak um, so artfully 
correctly described, we're looking at a new era in displacement where refugees are not running to the first safe haven. They are strategically looking for the safest place to put family members who are older or family members who are younger. And they are strategically crossing back and forth borders to protect property, to provide assistance, to volunteer for the, the war effort, to visit um, men in, in conscription ages who cannot leave. And so the complexity here is brand new. And I think it's something for us to consider when we're really thinking about placing the Ukrainian situation in our established ways of reacting to both refugee and IDP crises. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Frank, uh, Frank Duvel has just joined us. So Frank, if you could just uh, welcome, uh, if you could just jump into this discussion uh, about the unique flow of refugees from Ukraine uh, and the European response. Yes, hello everybody. Thanks uh, for having me. I've been working on Ukraine since 2006 and this uh, uh, recent war since November when I saw this coming did a couple of scenarios. And uh, first of all, I was really puzzled by the numbers and figures and statistics. They are really distorted. They are irritating. They don't really reflect the reality. And in particular, the specialities of this conflict, which is different from other conflicts we have seen in Europe. And this is the dynamic. Uh, it's a very fast, a very large flow. So within a couple of weeks, four months, we had as many Ukrainian displaced persons in the EU as we had from uh, Syria over the course of four years, uh, very similar numbers. But what was also not reported, and that's another speciality, is uh, the return migration. From the very first day, we saw people queuing on the Polish border wanting to exit the EU, going back to uh, Ukraine. It took UNHCR and international organizations a couple of months to recognize uh, that. And at the very beginning, we had accumulating figures, and it looked like we had four, five, and then uh, seven million uh, Ukrainians in the EU, but that was only the outflow, that was exit. In order to arrive at the net migration, we began seeing from May the numbers of return migration. So now we know that 4.8 uh, or 4.9 million Ukrainians have already returned. And uh, sort of balancing the outflow and the inflow tells us that we have around uh, four and a half million uh, Ukrainians in uh, the EU, a lot less than what is normally found in the media where the numbers are seven million. It's the same in Germany, the official rhetoric is we have one million Ukrainians, but if you look at those who receive temporary protection and who receive benefits, then it's rather 550 to 600,000. So the national figure corresponds with uh, the sort of aggregate figure for the EU. The particularity is indeed, it's a neighboring EU country, it's visa-free entry, it's a safe a, a journeys, risk-free, there is no protection gap like in the case uh, we have seen in, in Syria. People are coming and going, and I describe it as a kind of pendulum, a, a temporary protection-seeking people return uh, just for a long weekend for holiday to see their husbands, to see their parents, to look after their apartments and uh, whatnot. And this dynamic is fairly unique. On the EU side, this is a bit of a challenge because first of all, uh, because of the status, temporary protection, visa free entry, the numbers are not properly recorded and nobody seems to know how many Ukrainians are in the EU. As I've said, 7 million is an official figure. I'd say it's four and a half million. You can look at it through sort of secondary sources. Children at school is a very good indicator. That's one third of the refu refugee population. If you have 200,000 children in school, like in Germany, 
then you come up with 600,000 uh, people who receive uh, uh, benefits or other type of state uh, support, people who have a temporary protection status are very good uh, indicators. And uh, that brings me, because I want to uh, keep it brief, uh, to my third point. This is a bit of a challenge for a welfare state, which offers benefits in exchange for um, availability on the labor market for weekly or monthly reporting, which is not always the case with Ukrainians who are very mobile uh, and um, who come and go. That's why we uh, very recently had this uh, sort of uh, fairly uh, nasty EU politician re reference to Ukrainian welfare tourism. There is no evidence for that. But you can also already see that there is a certain potential to shift from the initially very welcoming, accommodating, friendly approach to a more sort of skeptical kind of thinking uh, whether everything is within the limits uh, of the law, whether we can integrate them into the labor market because labor market integration figures are very, very low. It's only 38,000 in Germany out of 600,000. So there are lots of barriers, bureaucratic barriers, uh, recognition of uh, qualifications is one, language barrier is the other, precondition to have integration courses uh, is a third. So it's a bit of a dynamic and volatile situation, but in any case, also with regards to the uh, reception, accommodation, integration matter, very different from 2015, 2016, there is not yet any tipping point. There is not yet any significant decrease in solidarity, uh, charity activity. There is sort of a gradual decrease, but this is typical for any crisis and uh, not, as I've said, uh, significant. So this is just it in a nutshell. Thank you. Uh, Will, you yes. are... thank, thank you very much, Frank. Um, I just want to follow up with the whole idea, the, the point that you raised about a potential tipping point. Uh, you kind of imply that the support for Ukraine is still strong. But is this skeptical thinking a sign that this would this will that the support for Ukraine would not hold for the long term? No, I don't really think so. I think the Ukrainian case compared uh, to the, let's say, Syrian case is uh, very different, not only because uh, they are European and not only because they are neighbors, but because they bring about sentiments over uh, Soviet memories of uh, occupation of a divided Europe of uh, uh, war and violence in, um, in in Prague, in Hungary, in Eastern Germany, and the solidarity and compassion with uh, Ukrainians is based on this kind of memories and, 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 and commonalities. And for that reason, I don't really, uh, a tipping point, even though there is a strong uh, pro-Putin, pro-Russian electorate in Germany, in uh, Hungary, in some other countries, which is vocal, but uh, very far from uh, sort of gaining majority or the upper hand in the discursive uh, uh, sort of battle. I'm gonna to turn to, uh, to uh, Andre uh, and Cindy. Uh, and just try to uh, tease out whether the migration from Ukraine and how different it is from the migration from Russia. Obviously, there are different circumstances. Uh, there are different uh, historical uh, memories. But 
obviously Russian migration has not just gone into Europe, but has gone also to the former Soviet republics. So what is the state of migration uh, from Russia? And how different is it from the Ukrainian uh, situation? Cindy, you're, you're muted. Oh, Mike, yeah. Um, I'm fortunate to have just returned from um, Tbilisi and was in Georgia during the establishment of mobilization and the um, well known eight mile. Um, long backup at the northern border. With the flow out of Russia to the near abroad, and this is true according to my Kazakh colleagues as well, we're really seeing a focus, not surprisingly, on young men in prime mobilization age groups. So we're really talking about early 20s. Because it is not a easy financial um, expenditure to make to get out of the country for an indeterminate amount of time, these are highly selective in terms of socioeconomic status. These are primarily people with educational um, qualifications that enable them to anticipate getting jobs in the, in, in the near abroad while they are displaced. This tends to be people who have contacts, either relatives or friends from college or um, uh, perhaps work colleagues who can get them out of the country and help them with accommodations. The reaction is quite different initially with this mobilization. Uh, there is great concern, particularly in Kazakhstan and indeed across Georgia with the effect that this massive migration has had on rental prices. Many students in Tbilisi, for example, are finding it extraordinarily difficult to try and find housing during the academic year because it coincided with this large influx of people from Russia who really soaked up almost all the available housing. So there are all sorts of um, inflationary pressures that are allotted. There is also um, on the street lots of talk about what the long-term geopolitical implications might be of having an extra large Russian um, uh, citizenry resident within your country. Um, less so in terms of them acting as, say, a fifth column, much more so in terms of having that population making these states particularly vulnerable to future Russian rescue attempts in terms of protecting those citizens. That's extraordinarily different. When we look at the Ukrainian flow, um, as Frank mentioned, we're looking at a lot of children a lot of children in the school ages and younger. We don't know actually the number of fractured families where parents, either one parent or both parents remain in Ukraine and one or two adults are taking care of several households of children. And that's something that we need to start keeping better records on because many people wanted children out and they are residing and staying in Eastern Europe for security reasons. But yet, um, as um, Olex pointed out, many adults are going back and forth from Eastern Europe and Ukraine in terms of humanitarian assistance work or in terms of um, other efforts to join um, the defense of the country. And so it's extraordinarily complicated, but a completely different demographic picture. Yeah. Well, can I, uh, can I add to yes. what he has mm -hmm. said? Uh, first of all, we have to look at everything in the context of uh, uh, what is going on in terms of the Kremlin policy. Uh, policy. Uh, we are encountering in regard to Russia, the second and third waves of post-Soviet migration. Uh, so the first one was in the 1990s, second started in February, and the last one uh, started essentially this month. And there is a very uh, big difference in that. Uh, during the 1990s, Russia has lost more than half of its academic uh, potential personnel. And uh, migrating were primarily people in basic sciences, the share of uh, uh, all social, and, uh, humani uh, social sciences and humanities was just 6%. Right now, we see a very different picture. Uh, Cindy mentioned that living are, first of all, 
men eligible for military service. Of course, there are people who live uh, based uh, on uh, uh, principles, uh, but uh, uh, dominant within these two flaws uh, were and are now are first of all uh, young people, uh, mostly professionals and not academics. And among academics, there is a very high share vice versa of people in social sciences. And quite frankly, one of the problems is that uh, not many institutions in the West uh, uh, are expecting them. Uh, the uh, atmosphere, the attitude is very different. And uh, Cindy mentioned the new, uh, well, uh, host countries for migrants. This is a drastic con uh, contrast with what was before. So countries that themselves were the source uh, states for migration to Russia, such as Kazakhstan, Armenia, Georgia have become uh, some of the major receiving countries, while some countries in Western Europe, first of all, uh, the Baltics, uh, Poland, uh, are essentially closing doors, even for those who oppose uh, the, uh, the war. So that, that's uh, a huge contrast compared to what this is. And then the general context, uh, we see that war became uh, an issue of personal survival for Putin on the, on the one hand. On the other, he clearly sees himself as somebody who is destined to destroy uh, the uh, Western and the US monopoly in the world. And the third point is the most interesting. He sees himself as a unifier of Russian or uh, Pan-Slavic uh, lands uh, in his view. So he sees himself as a historical figure. And that means that uh, for him, there is no uh, option of retreat. The, the, the retreat would mean both the loss of power and the loss of his kind of place in history. Therefore, we can expect the further uh, intensification of uh, um, uh, Russian uh, um, invasion uh, and its methods. And at the same time, uh, it uh, shows that uh, Putin, well, to some extent was forced to, but, but anyway, he made a huge political mistake by announcing uh, mobilization and by having his uh, defense secretary uh, state that potentially uh, mobilized could be not 300,000, but 25 million. Uh, in Russia, he immediately made this war uh, the uh, is, uh, issue uh, for the majority of the Russian population. Even those who didn't care now uh, know that either them or members of their families uh, could uh, become, well, uh, part of this mobilization drive. And therefore, we see a very serious intensification of this process. Contrary to many statements that were made uh, in February, March, uh, the first wave uh, that started with the beginning of invasion was probably on a level of 100,000 or maybe even lower than that. Uh, the second wave that started with the uh, announcement of mobilization uh, is already at least double uh, that, uh, that size. We can probably talk about 200,000. Uh, and again, um, the irony of the situation is that they are moving uh, to absolutely new destination centers, some post-Soviet states in the East and in the South, uh, countries of the Gulf, Turkey, and a number of others. So it, it signifies a total change of uh, geography, of direction of those migration flows compared uh, to what was happening, say, in the 1990s, with a simultaneous change of um, the character of structure of these flaws. So the preponderance of young males and uh, in professional terms, uh, uh, also very different from the original one, making it very hard for these people to find employment on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, the, the whole situation is marked by a change of attitude to people migrating from Russia. They were very welcome. Yeah, they were viewed as a part of this progressive change in the 1990s. And uh, uh, right now, very frequently, they are viewed uh, uh, negatively, uh, even simply because of the fact that they are uh, coming from Russia.
whatever their political views are. Thank you. Anyone want to add to Andre's comments? So I, I, I want to then turn back to our Ukrainian colleagues um, and basically try to narrow down uh, from their perspective, what is the role of the diaspora, of the Ukrainian diaspora, and how, how do the people who temporarily left Ukraine, how are they absorbed back into the country? Does one of our colleagues want to address that? It's probably something that Mikhail could talk about. Uh... Okay. Да, спасибо. Если говорить о роли украинской диаспоры и о том, что каким образом украинцы, которые сейчас оказались в других странах, будут интегрироваться либо возвращаться, то у меня несколько таких принципиальных позиций. Первое состоит в том, что вся украинская миграция нынешняя имеет недобровольный характер. Подавляющее большинство украинцев выехали не потому, что они хотели выехать, а это предполагает сильную мотивацию для возвращения. Сейчас мы не можем точно оценить, какой процент уехавших украинцев намерен интегрироваться, но приблизительные, очень грубые оценки говорят, что до 20% из общего массива украинской миграции – это люди, у которых есть установка не вернуться. Как сложилась эта цифра? Во-первых, на основании изучения установок украинцев, которые живут в Украине, до 20% были готовы уехать и остаться в Европе, в Соединенных Штатах, в России, в других странах. Война дала этим людям такую возможность. Плюс к этому небольшой процент людей не планировал интегрироваться в других обществах, но оказавшись в эмиграции, эти люди оказались привязаны к новым странам таким сильным фактором, как образование детей. Это очень, серьезный, это очень серьезная мотивация. Что интересно, украинским детям ну, намного более нравится европейская система школьного образования, чем украинская. Это наблюдение, сделанное по многим интервью с людьми, которые там живут. И это удерживает родителей, то есть усиливает их мотивацию остаться. Если говорить о той части украинской миграции, которая оказалась в России, то здесь ситуация иная. Вот она принципиально другая по сравнению с Европой. Поскольку в Россию украинцы попадали из зоны боевых действий очень часто без документов, очень часто без средств к существованию или с украинскими банковскими картами, которые в России не работают. И здесь очень сложно оценить процент людей, которые ориентированы на интеграцию в российское общество. Пока у нас еще очень мало статистической информации, например, о количестве людей, которые подали заявление о вступлении в российское гражданство. Но даже этот процент не характеризует установку человека остаться в России, потому что для некоторых украинцев получение российского гражданства – это вынужденная мера. Им что называется по-русски, просто некуда деваться. 
Кроме того, российские власти создали условия для очень легкого получения российского гражданства. Но я предполагаю, что процент украинцев, которые оказались в России и намерены там интегрироваться, примерно такой же, может быть, несколько менее 20%. Подчеркиваю, это очень грубые и предварительные оценки. Но я думаю, коллеги меня дополнят. Алекса. Yes, 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 yes. Ну, as my investigations showed that Ukrainian diaspora was actively involved in helping the newly arrived Ukrainians. Uh, the representatives of uh, the so-called old diaspora, uh, as well as labor migrants uh, of the period of Ukrainian independence, uh, helped to create Ukrainian centers in the recipient countries. They organize holidays and meetings, uh, so-called tea parties. Uh, 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 For example, in uh, particular in the Czech Republic, uh, approximately uh, 28% of uh, applicants for solidarity assistance for accommodation of forced uh, migration from Ukraine uh, in uh, their homes are Ukrainian who had lived uh, in the Czech Republic before the war. Cindy. I'm hoping this mic is working better. Is that true? Yeah. Great. Very good. I just wanted to add um, that when we're thinking about the return of those displaced from the country of Ukraine, we also have to think about how the Russian strategy in warfare has made it much more difficult in terms of the timeline for returning by focusing on humanitarian targets the incredible destruction of housing, hospitals, and schools will mean that the time for rebuilding is elongated, and therefore that people are gone for longer and the probability of return somehow dampens. I think that this is part of a strategy that goes against international norms of warfare, and it is central to really thinking about longer term who will stay and who will come back to Ukraine. Frank. Yes, if I may add one uh, dimension to this. Uh, there has been significant uh, forced migration from Ukraine also to Russia. And uh, we have heard about Uh, alternative less uh, green corridors only from Ukraine to Russia. We have heard about deportations, we have heard about kidnapping, adoption of uh, children, forced adoption, and of course we have also seen more or less the voluntary uh, relocation of Ukrainians from Ukraine to Russia. Again, the statistics are useless. This is UNHCR figures, 2.6 million. This is only entries, this is not persons. The number of forced migrants from Ukraine and Russia is probably a lot less. And what we also now see is onward migration of Ukrainian refugees leaving Russia, moving to various countries. Finland, Latvia, Estonia, uh, Georgia, Turkey, and other countries, amounting to at least already 250,000 people, but probably uh, more. So depending on the total number, this can be 10%, it can also be 25% of those who uh, have been uh, moving to uh, Russia. Uh, it's very important. Uh, we don't know much about that. They are not staying in Finland, they are not staying in Latvia, Estonia, they move on to Poland, they might even move back uh, to Ukraine, we've heard anecdotal evidence, they go back to the uh, 
government controlled area, they go back to the liber liberated area, they move to Germany. But this is adding to the complex uh, picture and uh, to the dynamics uh, that we have seen and that we need to uh, understand a lot better. The fate of um, Ukrainians in Russia concerns me a lot, I, I must say. Thank you. I just want to remind our audience that if you have questions uh, for our speakers, you can submit them via email to Kenan at wilsoncenter.org, via, via Twitter uh, at Kenan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Um, I see that uh, Professor Mukamil has joined us. So I know you've uh, missed some of the conversation, but if you just want to jump in here and talk about the question of Russian migration, uh, its consequences, and its long-term impacts. We can't hear you. Mike, well, Hi. Uh, Very good. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the uh, military uh, actions uh, in the Ukraine had led to the transformation of uh, several migration flows uh, in Russia. Firstly, uh, there are the flows of uh, refugees and uh, deportees uh, from Ukraine. Uh, secondly, the mass uh, emigration of uh, so-called uh, relocation from Russia. Uh, two waves of emigration are recorded. Uh, one wave uh, was immediately after, after the start of the entry uh, of Russian troops. Uh, the, the other uh, the other wave, uh, immediately after, after the start of uh, mobilization, so-called mobilization. Thirdly, there is a uh, uh, reduction of the, in the uh, influx of migrant workers, uh, mainly from Central Asia. Uh, also, uh, Probably we can say uh, about uh, change uh, in uh, internal migration. Avoiding uh, mobilization, many people uh, change the place of uh, residence, uh, living uh, for other uh, cities, uh, rural uh, areas especially. Uh, and finally, we. I think we can uh, expect a new wave of, of immigration. There are young men uh, being uh, drafted into the uh, uh, Russian army, and uh, formally, they can be sent to the places of uh, battles in Ukraine on the territories uh, that Russia uh, Consider this Russian. Uh, if uh, we uh, uh, can say, uh, if if we uh, uh, speak about uh, Russian immigration, uh, about uh, uh, first uh, and uh, second waves. Uh, I can uh, say that uh, these uh, waves are radically different. Firstly, the uh, scale of flows uh, are different. Estimates uh, of the first wave range from uh, uh, 100 to 400,000 to one million people. I think uh, it's uh, more like 
say about 200,000 uh, uh, of which some have uh, returned uh, in Russia. Uh, so uh, from this uh, wave, no more than uh, <coughs> uh, 0 0.1 uh, million uh, people remained uh, abroad. Uh, the second uh, wave uh, is much uh, larger. Uh, this can be, uh, we can see uh, about them uh, if we uh, see the prices of air tickets. Uh, at the peak of the first wave uh, in uh, early March, uh, a one-way ticket could uh, cost uh, up uh, to uh, 4.5 thousand uh, dollars. And uh, at the peak of the second wave, uh, the price was uh, twice uh, as much, about uh, $9,000. Secondly, I think uh, we can say uh, about uh, composition of immigrants. They uh, radically, uh, uh, <coughs> they, if uh, we can say, if we uh, say about first wave, uh, uh, we uh, can say uh, the, uh, that uh, this wave uh, in this uh, this wave. Uh, uh, during this uh, wave, uh, the people uh, go uh, from the largest uh, cities. Uh, the first wave uh, is the uh, opponents uh, of the gamma government. But uh, the second wave includes not only op opponents, uh, but also uh, a political and uh, even uh, people which uh, support, which were uh, supporters of the government. Uh, thirdly, uh, in the autumn, the uh, direction of immigration uh, uh, expanded. We went uh, not only uh, uh, to the West and uh, the South uh, Caucasus, but also uh, to the Central Asia and Mongolia. Uh, the cost uh, of air tickets to the Central Asian uh, capitals uh, has increased uh, about uh, uh, eight uh, times uh, in uh, two days. Uh, so, I uh, and uh, I can say that uh, this uh, immigrants uh, did not leave uh, Russia on emotion. Uh, they were uh, already ready, uh, ready uh, to leave uh, Russia. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Vladimir. We got some questions coming in from the audience. So I want to make sure that we have time to address the questions from the uh, audience. Uh, the first question comes from David Morado, and he asked, can the panel discuss the importance of sex and age aggregated data of the migrants in developing responses in surrounding countries? Uh, uh, I, 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 I see. We're, we're, we're going to go to Cindy now, Vladimir, because I think I saw her. Oh, she's, she's not nodding her head. Any, anyone want to try to take that question? I'm yes, ready. Cindy. Okay, Cindy and Frank. Okay. okay. 
uh, no demographer will bypass a question like this. So uh, one of the things that I think is really important about your question, David, is both the gender composition, clearly the outflow from Ukraine is going to be um, heavily skewed towards females simply because of the regulations about leaving the country. But the real, really the most important thing as um, my esteemed colleague pointed out is the age composition. And that is something that from the initial days of the war, the EU has been very focused on. There is a concern that once children start school, the potential for return migration drops precipitously. This is based on historical um, cases. It certainly will be a factor as we think about how many people will be coming back from um, um, Eastern Europe into Ukraine and Western Europe for that matter. However, what we haven't really focused on as much because there isn't data is not just age and sex composition of people who are moving, but the family and household units. Is an entire household leaving a country or is just part of a household leaving and part of it staying behind? Um, in this uh, terminology of fractured families, we really don't have established estimation um, uh, processes to understand what the effects are of having uh, the mother and children go away, the father stays at home, how that will affect the likelihood of return and how that might impede or accelerate the integration of refugees at their temporary destinations. And so I wish there was better data. Right now, there is not. Um, hopefully, the um, general surveys that IOM is, is doing both among refugees and IDPs will start focusing on this idea of household composition so that we can better understand how displacement has fractured families and as a result trace these groups and see what return policies might need to look like. Thanks so much for that great question. Frank, you wanted to weigh in as well. Yes, we know roughly that in the EU, 75% of the Ukrainian uh, displaced persons are a female. This is very different from previous displacements, Syria, Iraq, and so on, where it's exactly the opposite. 75% are men, and only uh, a third uh, are women. So this is another particularity of uh, of uh, the consequences uh, of uh, the war and displacement uh, in Ukraine. One third uh, roughly are uh, children aged uh, up to uh, 18. We don't have a breakdown. We are just now getting uh, the results of surveys. They are all not representative because we don't have a proper sampling frame. We see certain uh, dynamics, for instance, uh, in. August, just before uh, the beginning of the school year in Ukraine, uh, return migration peaked. There were about 80,000 within uh, just two weeks in the last week of August. And this can be explained with the beginning of the school year in uh, Ukraine. We have in Germany, for instance, 190,000 uh, Ukrainian children in uh, school now. Uh, with the beginning of uh, the um, autumn uh, semester. And we also see another particular challenge uh, with regards to uh, uh, women's opportunities, uh, 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 language courses, uh, 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 labor market integration. The prime concern is childcare. So uh, we have to arrange uh, childcare for several hundred thousand uh, children in Germany and in other countries. And only once that is arranged, we can think about integration courses, language courses, labor market integration and whatnot. Again, very different uh, challenges for the uh, respective municipalities than uh, what we had seen with uh, single young men. And in that respect, the question for gender and age is indeed very crucial. And we have a discussion, of course, 
about the perspective of integration, the perspective uh, um, of uh, of uh, language learning, of schooling, of a population that at the moment has a one year horizon, temporary protection, some have two years, there is a maximum of three years, and there is a debate of not wasting this one, two, three years, so offering something, but how much integration are we going to offer as if at the same time there is a time horizon and there is a hope and a perspective of return, how to best use uh, this time for the education of the children, but also for the adults, uh, of course, always also with regards to the return opportunity. We don't want offering integration, which would then diminish return um, opportunities and um, aspirations. So this is a very fine balance and uh, it's an open question. There is not yet any, uh, any agreement, I'd say. Thank you. Uh, Mikhail, did you want to weigh in on the question of children and education in, uh, in migration? Да, я хочу сказать, что наличие в миграционном потоке женщин с детьми, намного реже полных семей с детьми, является одним из серьезных факторов, которые определяют установку людей на интеграцию в новой стране. Но я хочу подчеркнуть, мы сейчас можем судить только об установке, то есть о намерениях этих людей. Мы еще не знаем, какова будет практика, каковы будут возможности для этих людей остаться и интегрироваться. Пока я могу уверенно говорить о том, что образование детей, точнее включенность детей в образовательный процесс является очень сильным фактором, который влияет на желание остаться в этой стране. Это явление является массовым. Но, на мой взгляд, это увеличивает общий массив украинских мигрантов, которые хотят интегрироваться в новых странах, примерно на 5%. Но это достаточно высокий показатель, если говорить в целом о миграционном потоке. Но это очень приблизительная оценка, основанная просто на многих интервью. Это не результаты репрезентативного исследования. И еще раз, очень многое будет зависеть от следующего фактора. Сейчас выехали, как правило, женщины с детьми. Ну, после объявления в Украине мобилизации мужчины призывного возраста не могут выезжать за границу, Точнее, могут только по специальным разрешениям, это единичные случаи. И э, через какое-то время возникнет большой вопрос, кто кого куда перетянет. Или женщина с ребенком своего мужчину в Европу, или мужчина, вернувшийся с фронта, скажет, что нет, вы возвращаетесь ко мне. То есть это процессы, которые очень сложно прогнозировать. Sorry, in Russian is possible. Yes. Да. Ну, э, мониторинг тех, той информации, которая вот в СМИ возникает, показывает, что на сегодняшний день количество украинских детей, которые идут в школу в странах-реципиентах, гораздо меньше чем общее количество детей школьного возраста в этих странах. То есть это говорит о том, что, по крайней мере, пока большинство ориентируется на, на последующее возвращение и, соответственно, на, 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 включается в дистанционное обучение Украин, в Украине, то есть в, 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 на украинской системе образования. Но, естественно, ситуация может измениться. Вообще, есть, все мы знаем, что есть общее миграционное правило. Чем дольше длится миграция, тем э, больший процент э, не остается и не возвращается. Поэтому все будет зависеть от того, насколько эта кризисная ситуация продлится. Спасибо. Uh, our next question comes from Melissa Stockdale, and she asks, do we have any sense of how many Ukrainians have been displaced 
from or have fled their hometowns to other parts of Ukraine, as opposed to those who have crossed borders into other countries? What kind of aid can be shown to them? Frank. Yes, if I may, this is another delicate, uh, contested, difficult to establish uh, figure. Uh, the International Organization for Migration, IOM, refers to a survey methodologically problematic, referring to first 7.5 million, and now I think it's down to 6.8 million. But if you look at the affected cities, the uh, many hundred thousand people who were staying in Kiev, even in Kharkiv and other cities, this is probably not plausible. And uh, there is a Ukrainian a demographer, uh, I can't recall her name, who suggested it's rather four and a half million. If you look at the registered uh, IDPs, it's just over 1 million, 1.5 million. If you look at sort of the regional figures of individual cities, then nothing is anywhere near uh, the 7 uh, million that IOM suggested. Cynthia is nodding. So we may talk about 4.5 million IDPs maximum. We may talk about uh, 4.5 million uh, refugees still in the European Union, so 9 million displaced persons altogether. Well, this is all rather estimates and uh, sort of uh, informed guesses than based on reliable data. Thanks. Cindy. Just based on some fairly um, tenuous estimates, looking at the regions of most extreme contact and the reported percentage of housing that has been destroyed. The numbers um, are much higher. So this 4.5 million or even um, higher um, estimates from IOM of almost seven or eight million internally displaced are likely extraordinary undercounts. Um, Part of this results from the fact that we don't, you know, the idea of displacement is extraordinarily complex and people, even the idea of homelessness is very, very complex. Many people in the early days of the conflict rented places in Western Ukraine, left regions that are of high contact. And so their house is destroyed, but they're not necessarily displaced or are they? And so we, we really need to think about one of the key issues in terms of migration in Ukraine, and that has to do with housing. Now there's, there's um, some benefit to the fact that the RADA has moved forward with um, uh, new programs and new laws about housing compensation. Um, there's a lot of criticism about them whether they will work is still an open question but they deserve some credit for really focusing in on housing because as we look at migration and displacement what's going to drive it is the protection and the rebuilding of housing infrastructure so right now on the back of the envelope calculations based on reported cities in the east that have have suffered enormous losses of their um, housing since the beginning of the escalated invasions in February, we're really looking at somewhere between nine and 10 million. So we're talking about a quarter of the population in Ukraine who has suffered damage to housing units. Um, that's a very difficult estimation in terms of precision. So there's, there's a lot of leeway there. But the extraordinary damage and degradation to housing that continues, especially escalating right now in Kiev, is something to really think about as a major driver of migration and displacement. We also have very scant information on the number of people who remain living in marginal housing that has been partially damaged due to um, 
shelling or or other um, elements in uh, linked to the incursion. And so I think when we're talking about migration and displacement, particularly internally, it's almost impossible to come up with a uniform statistic because we don't really have a really clear definition of what we're measuring, whether it's homelessness or, or um, geographic displacement or a combination of the two. And so better methodological approaches might be very useful as we look to the long term, um, hopefully post-conflict period. Thanks. Alexa. Thank you. Поток перемещенцев внутри страны, внутренне перемещенных лиц, он более мощный, более массивный, чем поток украинских вынужденных мигрантов за границу. И здесь есть несколько, несколько различий. Ну, Во-первых, проще все-таки оказывать помощь этим людям. Они находятся, я имею в виду, внутренне перемещенных лиц. Они находятся в правовом поле своего государства. И еще, кроме того, ну, такая, есть такая раз различие. Если поток вынужденных мигрантов из Украины в странах ЕС в целом, этот контингент в целом стабилизировался, да, есть некоторые новые пополнения, но они небольшие, есть возврат, он тоже не, не столь большой, то внутренние перемещенные лица – это как бы они, контингент, который постоянно изменяется, в постоянном движении, меняется распределение его по регионам и как выхода, так и расселения. Ну, скажем, в, если в, в марте из Киева выехало явно больше половины жителей, то после... 9 мая начали возвращаться. И не то, что начали возвращаться, уже, ну, в общем-то, из регионов Украины вернулись практически все. Из-за границы нет, а из, из регионов Украины практически все вернулись. И наоборот, Киев сейчас становится пунктом регионов реципиентом внутренне перемещенных лиц. До недавнего времени таким, ну, для, скажем, тех жителей Мариуполя и других ныне оккупированных городов Запорожье был местом их размещения. Но в нынешней ситуации они продолжают движение в других направлениях. Сейчас больше всего внутренне перемещенных лиц сконцентрировано в Центральной Украине. В, свое, в, первые, в первые дни войны Основное, основное был, главным реципиентом была Западная Украина. То есть этот поток действительно он постоянно в движении, меняется, и любые оценки в численности нужно привязывать к конкретным датам. Но все-таки то, что тот факт, что он более, более массивный, чем поток вынужденных мигрантов за границу, это не подлежит сомнению. Михаил. Да, спасибо. Я согласен с тем, что прозвучало. Я хотел бы только дополнить, что сильным фактором возвращения людей из других регионов Украины будет восстановление разрушенного жилья. Большинство людей, абсолютно с этим согласен, которые уехали, например, из Киевского региона, уже вернулись. Этот процесс начался в апреле. И сейчас он практически завершен. Я могу судить по своим соседям. Я живу в большой городской агломерации Ворзель, Буча, Ирпень, Гастомель. Вернулись практически все, кроме тех, которые далеко за границей и с детьми, которые там пошли в школы. Но не вернулись из других регионов Украины люди, у которых было разрушено жилье. Некоторые населенные пункты в Киевской области, например, Андреевка, ну, уничтожены практически полностью, там просто некуда возвращаться. Эти люди готовы вернуться, но в условиях постсоветской Украины для того, чтобы построить дом, нужно работать всю жизнь. У многих из них эта жизнь уже заканчивается. Поэтому, безусловно, необходимы программы поддержки в восстановлении э, жилья. Андрей и Алексей. 
I essentially have a follow-up question to Mikhail. I remember at the start of uh, uh, invasion, he uh, wrote a policy paper where he was saying that, uh, uh, well, refugees are mostly moving on their own, not getting uh, adequate support from the state. The question here uh, is related to what are uh, the conditions now? Does state have any of such programs you are talking about or state that doesn't really assist refugees while well, returning migrants? And the second question uh, is uh, kind of general to uh, all of us. We have talked about the situation in Ukraine, partially even about Russian migration, but the question uh, is uh, uh, about policies of the receiving countries. We see huge discrepancies, say, the EU activated policy, Canada introduced fast track policy, Britain is much less uh, well friendly to refugees. The US is still even now is struggling with the heritage of both COVID and Trump, uh, well, immigration policies and thus 75,000 uh, Ukrainians who were in the US legally acquired uh, a, ch uh, a chance, uh, a right to extend their stay for 18 months. But the announcement made by the Biden administration that it would bring uh, 100,000 refugees from Ukraine in two years, uh, well, it, it seems that the administration is not really ready to fully fulfill this, um, this promise, at least for now. So first, a question to uh, Mikhail about the assistance provided by the state. And second, to kind of everybody, what about the policies of the receiving countries? How effective are they? Thank you. Относительно первого вопроса по поводу мер государственной поддержки людям, которые были перемещены да, в масштабах Украины, если я его правильно понял, то ситуация следующая. Этих, э, это комплекс мер поддержки для разных ситуаций, для разных групп. И если говорить о том, что то наиболее нужно в настоящее время людям, то это, безусловно, государственные программы помощи в восстановлении жилья. Что происходит в действительности? Люди получают компенсации на какие-то отдельные виды работ. Ну, например, в Ирпене, который был тотально разрушен, за счет бюджетных средств людям помогли поставить окна. То есть просто поставить окна взамен тех, которые были выбиты взрывами или расстреляны из стрелкового оружия. В настоящее время этот процесс идет активно. То есть я проезжаю через Арпень каждый день, и я вижу, что люди, по крайней мере, в большинстве случаев новые окна поставили. Но этого, безусловно, недостаточно. Необходимы намного более затратные государственные программы восстановления жилья. Такие программы задекларированы, то есть информация об этом есть. Люди для того, чтобы попасть в эти государственные программы, охотно подают заявление в полицию о таком преступлении, как разрушение имущества. То есть это делается не столько для того, чтобы найти виновных, на это мало надежды, сколько именно для того, чтобы получить компенсацию от государства, когда эти компенсационные программы начнут работать. Второй вопрос, если я его правильно понял, это вопрос о лояльности различных государств, принимающих по отношению к украинским мигрантам. То есть, ну, скажем так, какие государства, какую миграционную политику реализуют. Я могу сказать, на основе наших коммуникации с людьми, которые уехали и находятся там, уехали и вернулись, 
уехали, вернулись на короткое время, потом опять возвращаются, это разные группы людей, что у самих украинцев нет э, достаточно четкого и полного восприятия э, политики по отношению к себе как более или менее дружеской. Э, люди не оценивают эту политику таким образом. Почему? Потому что большинство украинцев, которые выезжают, э, попадают под опеку местных неправительственных организаций, благотворительных фондов, и других ресурсов, которые им помогают, смягчая в каких-то случаях не вполне дружественную политику со стороны государственных органов. Вот этот волонтерский ресурс в Европе, по крайней мере, работает очень активно. И я бы сказал, что важным фактором здесь является не государственная политика, не ее лояльность, а развитость и сила волонтерской поддержки украинских беженцев в этих странах. Спасибо. Um, does anyone else want to add on to the second part of uh, Andre's question about uh, other countries and their attempts to uh, alleviate the migration flows? and to take uh, ref uh, migrants in. Cindy. Just very quickly, I think that we're really looking at a time game. I think there is an assumption that the longer conflict persists, the more pushback there will be on from nearby and far away recepting, receiving countries in terms of helping. Um, refugees and providing material um, support. It's particularly problematic simply because, again, the longer the conflict goes on, the greater the probability there will be less commitment towards the massive investment type of Marshall Plan needs that we will see in Ukraine at, after the cessation of this conflict to rebuild housing infrastructure, um, road systems, water systems, sewer systems, hospitals. The longer the, the conflict is, it goes on, the greater the probability that outside nations who have received refugees, who have expressed their assistance or their support for Ukraine, who have provided military aid, will somehow be diminished in their level of commitment and their economic ability to invest in what is going to be one of the biggest challenges of this century, which will be rebuilding Ukraine. Any other comments? So I want to basically add uh, or expand on one of the points that uh, Professor Mukamil uh, raised. And he mentioned the question of Central Asia and migration in Central Asia. And I wish I, I, I wish I want to have some of the our participants. I'm gonna have to hang up my phone here. Okay. Excuse me. Um I, I want the uh our 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 speakers to Uh, talk about what the impact of all these wars and all these migration will be on Central Asia. That's a broad question, but uh, we haven't really raised that issue uh, amongst our discussion. So, so what, uh. to, to what extent is Central Asia going to be dragged into this whole issue of migration Uh, people leaving Russia, migrants leaving Russia who have sent remittances back home, uh, to what extent is Central Asia going to change, as it were, uh, as a result of all this migration and movement? Uh, I think the uh, uh, migrant, uh, migration uh, from Central Asia countries uh, will be uh, 
Деколе I think that the uh, problem, uh, problems of Russian economy uh, uh, forced uh, the part of the uh, Central Asian uh, uh, migrants uh, back uh, to the homeland. Uh, but uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, after uh, February uh, uh, also uh, maybe uh, uh, have uh, some uh, uh, influence uh, for their uh, attitude uh, to the Russian uh, situation. Uh, Russian uh, political, social, and economy uh, situation. Uh, I couldn't uh, say about uh, forecast uh, of Russian migration, but uh, I know that we haven't any uh, migrant workers. Uh, uh, only we we, uh, we uh, have uh, migrant uh, workers only from Central Asia. The uh, uh, labor migrants from Ukraine couldn't uh, back uh, to Russia uh, the nearest uh, decades. Uh, the Moldavian uh, uh, labor migrants also, the, uh, I don't think that, that they back uh, in such size. Um, also, the future migration uh, is the uh, migration of uh, uh, migrants for, from Central Asia. Frank, Frank and then Andre. And we're going to have to bring it to a close after that. Yeah, thanks. We just had a two-day uh, workshop on uh, the war and forced migration in the Global East uh, yesterday and today with colleagues from Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, and uh, Moldova. A couple of points were raised um, uh, with regards to this uh, question. One, of course, is the migration of uh, Russians to these countries and how that impacts on the population balance. But the Kazakh colleague, for instance, explained that much of that migration is transit migration. So Russians arriving in Kazakhstan actually move somewhere else. Uh, much of the very high figures uh, we uh, see are just uh, records of uh, border crossings. So there is in-migration, but there is no recording of the out-migration. Again, we need to look at the net uh, movements in order to get a clearer uh, picture. Then we've also heard about the colonization of many of these uh, countries in the past uh, by uh, ethnic uh, Russians, which uh, has been an issue which is now sort of a little more openly discussed as a form of uh, colonization. We hear about uh, the uh, economic problems of Russia and the sort of diminishing opportunities uh, for people to migrate to Russia and Kyrgyz uh, colleagues report uh, that they see now more uh, Kyrgyz uh, migration to Turkey and to the Gulf countries, uh, also to the European Union, the quotas are discussed with various uh, countries to develop alternatives to uh, migration uh, to, uh, to Russia. So this is in flux, it's an open question. It's something that uh, we might uh, want to follow up actually. And I leave it there, thanks. Thank you. Andre. Well, uh, two things. First, uh, uh, Will, I, I would like to thank you and the uh, Canon Institute for uh, letting us meet and offering us your platform uh, to discuss these issues. Uh, the second thing is, in regard to, again, Central Asia, I think uh, we still face 
uh, a, a significant change uh, in the direction of migrations. On the one hand, as you mentioned, Will, yourself, uh, uh, this uh, can lead uh, to uh, the decline of uh, remittances from uh, uh, Russia to a number of Central Asian countries. Second, uh, to uh, the increasing pressure on welfare systems and labor markets in a number of those countries. In regard to Kazakhstan, uh, of course, this invasion creates uh, a, a very touchy uh, situation for a number of countries, including Moldova uh, and Kazakhstan. Uh, it is a precedent and these countries will think about uh, what, what would happen next. Yet in regard to uh, migration, uh, I think Kazakhstan uh, in reality is not uh, uh, only facing transit migration. I think they, Kazakhstan was competing uh, with Russia for labor resources even before that. And I think that uh, it's not only individual migration. We know that many companies move their offices to uh, uh, Kazakhstan. I think uh, migration would be transit in uh, centers like Georgia or Armenia because they simply don't have adequate uh, infrastructure and logistics for uh, big companies. But uh, movement to Kazakhstan, uh, the, to the Gulf might be much uh, more permanent and associated with particular business uh, offices. So, uh, this uh, uh, situation creates really uh, significant long-term negative consequences for a number of countries, including those in Central Asia. Even though um, migration flow, as Vladimir has mentioned, from uh, Central Asia specifically, not from Kazakhstan to Russia will continue, whatever is going on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Andre. And I think we're going to bring our conversation to a close now, but I want to thank all of our audience for their questions and our participants for your uh, in insightful analysis and discussion of this very important question. And we look forward to seeing everybody at the next Kennedy Institute event. So thanks very much. Thank you.